This podcast includes explicit content. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everybody. Welcome to your latest episode of the Erste's Podcast News, where we sit down and chat with fabulous people who we think have something interesting to say. Whether that be authors, artists, activists, sex workers, you name them, we've met them. Today, the Erste's Podcast meets Susanna Weiss. Hi, Susanna. How are you doing? Hi, I'm good. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for coming today. Susanna is an editor at Complex, writer at Teen Vogue, New York Magazine, Vice, Bustle, Glamour Mag, Washington Post, Playboy. She's also working on a book and she holds degrees in gender and sexuality studies, cognitive neuroscience and modern cultural media from Brown University. Pretty impressive. And then one more thing, every Monday night as part of O School, she, she does a sex education talk picking the kind of topics of the week in sex news. So what did we learn about in sex this week? There was a study showing that men and women were asked how many sex partners they had in their lives and the average that women said was seven and the average men said was 14. And obviously like that doesn't match up. Someone's got to be lying. <laughs> <laughs> So oh, interesting. They think that men are overestimating. They found that men would sort of estimate rather than count the exact and they would round up. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm talking about the standards of masculinity that make men do that and all the problems they cause. The notches on the bedpost type mentality. You yeah. think it could also be that it is true, but actually it's women are round, like rounding it down? I think the authors found that men were more likely to say they were estimating rather than counting it exactly. So I think that's why they thought the men were the ones lying. Um, but I think it's plausible that women would round down because they don't want to think of themselves as sluts. Yeah. That was a uh, heterosexual men and women, I assume. Yeah. Because then, then it could I add mean, up differently, right? It could mean like a lot of men are having sex with each other. I don't think men having sex with, with each other would account for that much of a difference. No. It's interesting the, the numbers thing, how there's so much cultural difference in that as well. In places like America, it's really like way higher numbers. Do you know what it is in Germany? I don't actually. I did check all of this at one point. I had a little investigation. Do you know? No, I don't. It kind of freaks me out. I see it and I see that original. I'm like, oh, oops. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, those guys who are like, ugh. I've lost count, but it's like true. <laughs> Shall we t start by talking about some of your interesting writing on gender stereotyping? You wrote an article called We Need to Stop Saying Men Are More Visual ASAP. Where do you think the, the visual thing comes from? Well, I think it wasn't always the case that this was believed. Well, you look at like right now in museums, most of the nudes are women, but it mm. used to be that most of them were men. Like a young man was considered the pinnacle of beauty. And then I think it was sort of in the Victorian era that women became, because there was more of a division of gender roles um, with women in the home and men working and there came to be this idea that women are more pure and men are more sexual and men like to look at women but not the other way around because women are innocent. Yeah, I think it comes from women being objectified and everyone thinks that's the natural of order of things because that's what they've grown up with. Mm -hmm. And I've even heard women say things like women are just more aesthetically pleasing, which I personally think we've all grown up with women being sexualized. So I think that that's what we've learned. One bit that you wrote in that article that I found really, really interesting was that you quoted Lisa Wade, the sociologist, and said that maybe men are scared of being preyed on. She theorizes that this is a source of men's homophobia, but the potential to be objectified by women could be just as threatening. Can you maybe explain that a bit further? There's this division in our society of people in a sexual situation into subjects and objects or predator and prey. Mm -hmm. And it's assumed the person doing the looking is the one in power and the person being looked at is somehow disempowered. So if a man is being looked at, I think that puts him in sort of a feminized position mm -hmm. of like being the one... Um, 
who's disempowered and but you also hear men say they would like to be you know admired more so it's not that they don't want to be admired i think it's this fear of being someone's prey it actually really made me think about some of the writing on like psychoanalytic writing on cinema and like female characters in horror movies you know the things that men are afraid of like often these characters are maybe like just hitting puberty or like sexualized women in some ways or they're like pregnant and there's some kind of horror mm. surrounding that and mm. there are sort of theories about objection like men are you know they're kind of trying to project their psychic fears and then watch it happen yeah i think there's this theory um terror management theory that says we fear things that are bodily because they remind us of the fact that we're just bodies and we're subject to death that women have been associated with the body menstruation and childbirth and all these processes remind us that we're in a body so we don't like to think about that and we have horror around it Mm -hmm. so maybe that's also behind like the use of women in horror movies just picking up again quickly on the men wanting to be seen and also like women wanting to see men if you look at studies I don't know, studies like Pornhub. It's something around 40% of the male gay porn videos on that are watched by women. I was watching this uh, film the other day. It was called Adored. And it was about these two older women. And they have affairs with like each other's young sons. Oh, yeah. For me, it was kind of like watching a gay movie. Just because there is really like not that many things outside of gay male genres where they like worship the male body in this way Mm. and they had all these like beautiful slow shots of these like muscly young (laughs) boys getting out of the water (laughs) do you think that this stuff has a role to play and why women feel so inclined to watch gay porn yeah well i think there's not that power dynamic where men are degrading women Mm -hmm. and choking them and calling them sluts and acting like that's the norm (laughs) there's also a dynamic in straight porn where the man's pleasure is paramount and the woman seems her pleasure is almost treated as accidental like if it happens great but like the goal and I wrote about the money shot how it um, conveys this idea that like a male orgasm is the goal of a sexual encounter I think that's also why lesbian porn is so popular among women yeah because women's pleasure is taken into account and there isn't this dynamic where one person's in power and they're dominating the other and so it seems a bit less misogynistic. I also wanted to talk about the stereotype that women often get, that you had a really great tweet pinned to your Twitter at the moment, saying women are not defective by design, sex doesn't have to be painful, periods don't have to be painful, female orgasms are not elusive, women are not more prone to pain, women don't have less access to pleasure, women are not poorly built, women are not unlucky. But women get these stereotypes where pain is expected or not taken seriously or even there's this like oh it's difficult to we're just not not as simple or something like we're more, we're too complicated and I think probably the darkest part of that for me is, is not just the well this is really sad that like then female pleasure really suffers in sex but that it has like much wider like medical implications studies have shown like women their pain is taken less seriously by doctors they spend more time waiting in the emergency room and like we're taught basically that if we're having menstrual pain or pain during sex in particular that it's something we have to suffer through when there are solutions to those things like menstrual pain is usually if it's not something that can be killed by a painkiller then it's something that you should see a doctor about and endometriosis Mm. always goes undiagnosed because of that and pain during sex can usually be avoided even the first time the biggest cause of it at least one sexologist told me is like tension and it's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy in that way the whole painful sex thing I just think in the way that we don't talk about it really unless we're talking about say like people losing their virginity how is is it quite common yeah I think one in ten women have reported pain during sex 
Yeah, and it's often a sign of a medical problem. Sometimes it's just something like a lack of lubrication or a lack of arousal um, or like overly deep penetration. Apparently there's a mm. new device that like goes around the penis and stops it from going too far in um, to combat that. But pain during sex, like during the first time, it's almost romanticized. Like, I remember reading Erotica mm. and there were these stories about the first time that was like, and then she was in pain and then like he wiped away her tears. <laughs> <laughs> if women are portrayed as this like to be seen do you think that that also has an impact in in like making like female pleasure being a difficult thing because if you're having sex with someone and you you're this objectified thing then you're gonna have to be performing or kind of self-conscious because you're there to put on a show. I think I saw an article in Cosmo that was like ways to look good naked, which... I think I've seen that too, <laughs> like throughout my childhood. <laughs> it promotes this hypervigilance where you're like monitor monitoring yourself during sex. Even if you're thinking positively, there was another Cosmo article like things he loves about your naked body. But to me, that's like more objectifying because then you're there thinking about like, okay, it's okay. He loves my boobs rather than like, how does... What, what am I looking at? How does it feel to be in my body? Yeah, being present. And I think there's also this idea like that it's men's role to be sexual and women's role to be sexy and that women are designed to provide pleasure rather than experience it. And I think that contributes to the view of that female orgasms are elusive and that uh, women's pleasure isn't important to them because they their role is to look good and provide pleasure. I hear a lot of women say like they like the sound of yeah. a man or, and wish, wish men would make more sounds. But I guess maybe they're not thinking of it as a as a performance so much or they yeah. don't think they're allowed. They think that that's what that means. Maybe when a woman's yeah. moaning. There was a study showing that women, they moaned the most like right before their partners were going to come, but yeah. like not when they came because they were treating it as a way to turn their partners on. Yeah, like men may not think like what sound would be most pleasing to her. They're just thinking, making noise because it comes out of them. Whereas women, it's very calculated. I find it really interesting, your critique on calling certain sex acts like going down on a woman or something like that of not calling it foreplay because that's like it's a warm-up for the man did you want to explain yourself why you think that that shouldn't be called foreplay yeah so i was reading this book the height report from the 70s it's a series of studies on surveys on women's sexuality and all of them were talking about how torturous it is to like be brought almost to the point of orgasm and then they switch to something else mm. and something that they don't usually orgasm from um intercourse which I think only about one fourth say they consistently orgasm from. So that contributes to the orgasm gap to have the idea that foreplay is not something you do to completion, but it's just a warm up for intercourse. And it's also just silly that we put this one act above all others. It's not necessarily more intimate. It only occurs between people where like the couple has a penis and a vagina, which isn't all couples and uh, women often get more pleasure out of other acts so they should be just as important so this is an interesting but in Pornhub's 50 most popular videos 78% of men but only 80% of women are shown having an orgasm I mean if I watch them I think well I don't know how they're measuring like which women are being shown having an orgasm because I just see them screaming is that because we're not see <laughs> these men are just never making women come so they have no idea what it looks like <laughs> could that be also like that we're not portraying it very well yeah. it, you say even you you're like watching it and you're like wait was that what was that <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, part of the problem is it's usually from the same study, um, the majority of the or orgasms, I'm putting that in quotes because I think they were probably fake, were from yeah. anal sex or vaginal sex. Already men are learning, they just have to like pound away at a woman and she'll come. There's not that much shown with like oral or manual sex on women. Mm -hmm. If it is, it's depicted like we were talking about as a warm up to intercourse. It drives me crazy. I see this even on feminist 
feminist porn sites. Yeah. You can't have a female orgasm in your feminist porn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wouldn't it be really refreshing to have the man have an orgasm and then the woman after that? Yeah, I would like that. But they fall asleep though, don't they? That's the thing. Often for women, after they've sort of had an orgasm, like their clitoris becomes quite sensitive and they're like, okay, <laughs> don't touch it right now. It's not like that happens and then sex stops. Right, because and they're expected to keep going. Yeah, it's always made out that for them it's like this major exertion that they've gone through <laughs> and they're like, whoa. <laughs> Is that actually the case? Is it any more so? Or is this just part of this prioritizing of pleasure thing? I think a lot of women also get sleepy. Like you hear about women masturbating to help themselves fall asleep. And a lot of women say that after they orgasm, like the clitoris becomes hypersensitive. They don't want it to be touched. But like you never hear about that. And there's the expectation that we all have multiple orgasms. Yeah. Whereas like if a man comes, then that's suddenly an excuse to stop everything, whether the woman has or not. Regardless. Interesting about this whole ending porn with a money shot thing because for me it's I watch quite a lot of porn because I'm editing it um like it's really it's not even just that bit it's so much of it it's like the angles that people shoot at so like I was thinking the other day like what if you performed and shot cunnilingus in the same way as a woman doing a blowjob can you imagine if you With gave it like headline. the headlight below <laughs> And this big, like, ceremony and the woman's just there kind of thrusting forward. (laughs) It's it's just treated so differently, like, those two, like, oral sex acts. They should make, like, a parody porn video. I know. Like, what they did with the Avengers, like... (laughs) When they had all the men with their butts sticking out and Black Widow, like, looking strong, they should do that with porn. That's a really good show. (laughs) I'm going to pitch that tomorrow. Do you think this kind of power that's so inherent in these kinds of acts especially in porn and probably in real life too, is also caught up with a fear thing. My theory on it is that there's a problem with masculinity and feeling like vulnerability and that maybe there's a kind of shame caught up with this sexual release that they're going through and to like cover that emotional thing up they just kind of like stand above someone and it's like yeah take it and they (laughs) so that they kind of can pretend it's like a macho thing rather than like this quite weak like embarrassing (laughs) yeah there's like no connection because maybe that would be too vulnerable maybe there is an element the cum shots all over women like maybe that's trying to make men feel less ashamed of their bodily fluids Maybe it makes then the bodily fluid, is this what you're saying? Kind of then it's associated with this aesthetically pleasing (laughs) woman because it's like over their face. Yeah, it's like they're accepted. Speaking about all this kind of imbalance between sort of male, female pleasure, I think you might be inclined to think, oh, what we need to do about this is like raise up female pleasure then and let's solve it all by having amazing orgasms as women. But you've written about this, haven't you? About this idea of like a kind of superior orgasm. And you went to quite an expensive workshop. Oh, it was um, sex educator Betty Dodson's workshop. Okay. Um, she does them in New York I believe they collect $200 from you there's also like a thousand dollars suggested donation and women masturbate together in a circle and show their vaginas to one another and name them and have a bunch of discussions and do massages okay I like how you put it like a vagina show and tell in your piece I was like that's good okay and it lasts for a day uh two days That's quite intense. Yeah, people came from all out of town. There was someone from Iceland, people from all over the country, someone from Germany. Do you find that people there have done this kind of thing before? Or what was drawing people to this event? A lot of them seemed to idolize Betty Dotson, so they wanted okay. to learn from the master. Like some of them had sexual professions. There were a few sex researchers and a sexological body worker, so I think they were just interested in learning more. Then there were some people with sexual problems. One woman, like, who could only orgasm on her stomach and wanted to learn to, like, flip around. Yeah, I know. She sees people who have never had an orgasm to teach them how. I've spoken to so many 
friends recently that have brought up things like that. Like, not to the extent of not having one, though I've had that's come when people are like, I don't know, how would I know if I'd had one? And you're just like, you know. But yeah, just lots of friends being like, didn't have an orgasm until I was like 20 or whatever, or assumed that it just wasn't for me. <laughs> <laughs> I just wrote it off. So it seems like this kind of a workshop has a place. Do you think it was useful in that way? That this should be a more widespread thing or should it be like a part of sex education like why are we having to go to these like specialist pricey new york workshops <laughs> <laughs> to learn how to orgasm yeah i guess we learn nothing about female orgasm in sex education mm. um yeah i think i first learned about it in like an advice book for teen girls I think I first discovered it accidentally and then I like learned the word for it. But if you don't discover it accidentally and you don't like learn the concept, there's just no way to know. Going back to the workshop, how did you feel about it? I, I felt like I got a lot out of it. I, I don't idolize Betty Dodson and Carlin Ross like other people do though. Like I think they have a very stereotyped idea of female sexuality. I also learned that I don't need to aspire toward this idea of like female pleasure that's like, you know, female pleasure is supposed to be like transcendental and super intense and like these standards that we don't hold men to. So that's, or that like if you're a woman and you masturbate, it's like empowering, which for some, I know for some people it is, but for me it was always like, what am I missing? I don't feel empowered. Like goddess type creatures. <laughs> like Chimamanda Ngozi she was talking about it recently and she was just like, this is also part of the problem. Every time we like try and mythologize women, even if it's a supposedly like positive thing, it, then it's just takes away from them being able to just be like normal human beings. Yeah, because then, and this comes up not just in sex, but, like, I once dated a guy who was mm -hmm. like, I worship women because every woman is a mother. Women are so nurturing and caring. And it's like, you're not really appreciating me or appreciating the stereotype mm -hmm. you're projecting onto me. I'm a, I'm a nice guy. I actually think women are much better than men. <laughs> you're like, no, we're not. We're just as bad as you. <laughs> and that's what we want. <laughs> no, we're not just as bad as them. Come on. I do think like orgasm equality is important though, but not necessarily like because it reflects a view of male and female pleasure and it reflects a view of men and women, but that doesn't necessarily translate to the more orgasms you have, the more empowered you'll be. Isn't it weird how the kind of like the multiple orgasm thing is maybe, I sort of think it's a bit like the notches on the bedpost thing like we were talking about at the beginning with the numbers. I feel like sometimes among women there's then that sort of pressure to like have multiple multiple orgasms and be like I had like nine orgasms it was the best sex of my life <laughs> um but that actually even just like prioritizing orgasms and sex in that way is is quite like limiting sex isn't necessarily automatically bad because you didn't have an orgasm then I can't have an orgasm if I'm feeling like they they are so pressured to make it happen I'm like oh my god this is way too stressful <laughs> Can we just enjoy it and see and then it will be fine? But there is this kind of like, if it doesn't happen, there's just this intense failure. Like there's maybe kind of quite an egotistical thing. Yeah, there was a study where men and women were asked like, about a scenario where a woman didn't orgasm during intercourse and mm -hmm. like both of them said their biggest concern was like the man's ego um, yeah. and how masculine he felt. So then like having an orgasm becomes not even for the woman herself, but to stroke a partner's ego. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> also good isn't it thank you so much for today Susanna um if you'd like to learn more from Susanna and read her amazing articles you should follow her on twitter at Susanna Weiss uh s-u-z-a-n-n-a-h-w-e-i-s-s -S. so we finally have a sponsor and this is none other than Erstice that's right the Erstis podcast is sponsored by Erstis. Who would have thought it? This means if you want to see what our day job looks like, then head to erstis-podcast.com slash erstis. That's E-R-S-T-I-E-S. -E Check out the video and follow the link and you'll receive 50% off your first month. Please note that the content is 18